Thank you very much, Mike. That was uh, very, very kind of you. And I, I, I really do believe in London Historians. I think it's an excellent thing. It came out of our teaching at Bath Spa when we started doing a core compulsory module for our first year students. And we wanted to try and find a way to make history really palatable for them. And we thought, well, let's embed it in something. And there wasn't enough stuff out there published easy for uh, our, our first year students to work with on Bath although Bath's fascinating. So we thought, well, let's do London because there's masses of information. And so we did. We developed a big course around that and we taught it for about 10 years. I'm not sure if it's still going now. But that's where my interest in London came from to begin with. And it's sort of, you know, sort of trickled along all the way along. And, and this particular paper comes out of um, some work that I was doing on something else, on sociability. And I was thinking about what was going on in London. I was thinking about the London season. I was looking at a bunch of different diaries and, and journals and newspapers. And all of a sudden, this visit of the Allied sovereigns popped up. And there was a wonderful set of quotations. And one of them was, everybody seems quite wild and emperor hunting in London in 1814. So that's what I want to talk about today. This is, this is new research, it's brand new, and so there's going to be lots of rough edges around it, and I'm interested in conversation and questions and discussion. So please, if you've got any, um, don't be scared to ask at, uh, at the end. And I'm probably going to talk more than read if I can. All right, what I wanted to do was start and put you back into the spring of 1814. Napoleon's been defeated. Peace could now return to Europe. The longest war in living memory was over, and Londoners, noble, official, commercial, all of them, laborers, celebrated Napoleon's abdication in April with grand illuminations, and this, this comes from some of the illuminations. It's sort of a composite image. Mottos such as long live the Bourbon, surprisingly, our brave allies and Moscow burnt, Paris spared, which I think you'll see up in the top right-hand corner, vied with heartfelt declarations of peace, or in the case of the excise office and Hudson's Bay House, peace and commerce, and the occasional place that actually did uh, puffs of victorious self-satisfaction, such as the glorious result of British perseverance, or Europe saved by the example of England. Um, <laughs> Somerset House, I, I, thought you, I, thought, I thought you might enjoy that. Somerset House was the most blatantly patriotic of all, blazoned across the full length of the top of the building in letters three, three feet high, made from innumerable bite small lamps, were the words, and I'll, my Latin is impossible, so this, excuse me, Europe instaurata auspice Britannia tyranne tyrannae Lide subversa vindice libertatis, and basically Europe established under the protection of Britain, and you can go from there. <laughs> While such a statement may sound more than a little bittersweet today, given Britain's uncertain nature in the world and our very troubled relationship with Europe, its purchase in 1814 was real. And what I want to do tonight is I want to explore a little bit of London's fascination and Londoners' fascination with um, the subsequent visit of the Allied sovereigns and various assorted princes and diplomats to London that summer. Um, this visit took place between the 7th and the 22nd of June, 1814, and surprisingly, although it features in a number of different historical romances and in some blogs and in the occasional bit of European history, there's preciously little that British historians have actually written about it, which is what really surprised me. And what I wanted to know was, what was it about the presence of these great men, for it was largely great men, um, that drew enormous crowds and that brought people of all classes out onto the streets at all hours of the night in hope of seeing them or sometimes even touching them? For James Frampton, writing to his mother on the 12th of June, shortly after the uh, sovereigns and company had come, the atmosphere in London was decidedly feverish and the excitement was infectious. Anything so entertaining as London, he wrote, at present I never saw. 
and I do not think that anyone at this moment is quite sane. And this kind of repetition, this repetition of the infectious incitement, the, the contagion, the feverishness of the, the desire to see these people is repeated again and again and again in diaries and letters from the middling sort all the way up through the aristocracy. And I'd like to do more work to see if I can dig something further down the, the um, social scale. So what do I want to do tonight? Well, a couple of things that I'd like to do. First of all, I want to give you a sense of the, the kind of excitement that the Allied Sovereign's visit inspired. And so doing, I want to give you some sense of the kind of energy that London could have at the height of the Regency, and also during a good summer, because it was, a nice, it was nice weather. It would have been much different if it had rained for the entire time they were here. I also want to call your attention to the growth of celebrity culture. This is something that's been developing through the 18th century, but this is really a moment where we can see it being, it's come to a, come to a head. And to the role of the press, and the British press is very important in this, in creating and maintaining and disseminating celebrity culture. So the tabloids of today and the focus on Diana is nothing compared to what they were doing here. I also want to consider the way that this visit called attention to the heroism and the martial traits of military masculinity and how it elevated them, specifically how it elevated them in contrast between Alexander I, the Emperor of Russia, and our own dearly beloved Prince Regent. And finally, I want to speculate a little bit about the relationship and what it tells us about the relationship between Europe and Britain at the time, about the seeds of British myth-making that are going to, after Waterloo, put Britain at the center of the story of the Napoleonic Wars, but at this point in time tell us something slightly different. So those are the kinds of things I want to talk about today. So before I go on, because I know not everyone's going to be an 18th century historian or necessarily a military historian, let me just say a little bit about the background. And as I said, this is a, a story of heroes. And Britain, Britain had been at war since 1792. This is, this is the longest war in, in these people's memory. There's only been a brief pause to recoup forces during the P Treaty of Amiens, the Peace of Amiens, 1802-1803. Britain had financed campaigns and fought campaigns against, a, an, against Napoleon, the French and Napoleon, with a fluctuating group of different sets of allies and trying desperately to halt Napoleon's a, approach across Europe and, of course, to halt French ambitions, including ambitions against England and, and the English. The turning point in the war had come in 1812. Um, and it had come with Russian's disastrous, or um, Napoleon's Rus disastrous Russian campaign, and I'm sure you're all familiar with that, that. By the time that the last poor bedraggled Russian troop had left, um, uh, sorry, the last bedraggled French troop had left Russian soil in December 1812, Napoleon's army had lost over 400,000 men, or right around that and innumerable horses. And as Professor D um, Dominic Levin has said several times, sometimes it was much more important that they lost all the horses than the men, because the men you could recruit, the horses needed to be really trained. And so consequently, it's a, it's a very difficult scenario. It's the turning point for Napoleon. And out of this comes the Sixth Coalition. Um, Prussia, Prussia and Austria break free of France, and they join Britain, Sweden, Spain, and Russia in combining against Napoleon. And while the British under Wellington are primarily occupied in the peninsula, the combined European forces, with of course some British forces as well, are being led effectively by Alexander I, Emperor of Russia, um, who is then in his early, early 30s and at the height of his power. Now he is supported by the King of Prussia, and his two teenage sons, and a various array of European princes, a lot, lot of them who are um, German, of course, and an, an assortment of generals, especially two. One is the Russian general Platov, who is the head of the Ataman or the Hetman of the Don Cossacks, and quite a character in his own right, and um, General von Blücher. Um, and Blücher, of course, is going to play a much bigger role in Waterloo. But by this point in time, by the abdication of, 
of Napoleon. They are already the two key men who have created a, a real story around themselves and have had their, their images and their, um, their exploits publicized across, across Britain in the newspapers. So these are, these are the people that we're going to be looking at. These are the people who are the most important at the time. Now, it's the, war, the winter season of 1813-14 that brings the, the war to a close. And while Wellington has been successful at Vittoria you know, earlier in June, it's actually the Battle of the Nations or the Battle of Leipzig in October 1813 that really is a key turning point. It's the first real defeat that Napoleon suffers. And it's that that spurs Alexander on, driven in a sense almost by a divine mission. You know, he believes that it is his mission to unite Europe and to, to create a kind of confederation of peace at this point in time. Um, quite interesting in its own right. Um, and he drives towards Paris, drives the armies towards Paris. By the 30th of March, the Allied forces are camped outside basically the walls of Paris, if we had them. And over the course of the next day, they take Paris. By the 31st of March, Talleyrand is giving the keys of Paris to Emperor Alexander. A Russian army with about a half a million men is the liberating army of Europe at the time. Now, that's a bit one to put in your pipe and smoke it today. By 6th of April, Napoleon has been forced to abdicate. And as British satirists said, there was a happy dance for Europe as a result. Uh, Napoleon is, of course, being exiled to Elba uh, by a wonderful assortment of demons there. Now, there's celebrations in, in Paris, of course. There's masses of celebrations. And it's at this point in time that we get the arrangement for the um, Allied sovereign's visit to England. Alexander had wanted to visit England anyway. He had had close contact with a group of sort of young English Anglophiles in his upbringing, in his education. His sister, the, the widowed Grand Duchess of Oldenburg, was already here, supposedly playing politics and trying to influence who Princess Charlotte was going to marry or not. And he really wanted to see what was going on. It also was effectively a victory lap of honor for him around Europe. Now, Castlereagh is intelligent, and he wants to make sure that this isn't just a tribute for Alexander. So when the invitations go out, they go out to Alexander, but they also go out to the King of Prussia, his sons, every assorted prince he could find that had been involved, and the diplomats, generals, and assorted members. So what descends upon England in June is a vast array of the great and the good and the glorious and the martial and largely the male members of the European elite. And these are the people who have been involved in the battles, in the diplomacy. They are the men of the moment. They are the heroes of the moment, and some of them very truly that. Now, what's interesting, of course, is Wellington himself is not here at the time. He doesn't come until just after these people leave, because he's otherwise occupied. So the visit is, is arranged. Of course, it appeals vastly to the Prince Regent, who loves spectacle, who loves parties, who loves entertaining. It gives him an excuse to design new uniforms, um, to build spectacular and expensive um, uh, uh, edifices in the various parks uh, that he designs, and so on and so forth. So there's, there's all kinds of things that it appeals to. Um, but it's also taking place in a broader context. And we need to think about that broader context. So we've got this group of military men, the heroes of Europe, coming to celebrate. But at the same time, we're doing it at, against a backdrop in England, which is anything but necessarily happy. And one of the problems with that that is going to come through this visit is the combination and the contrast between the people who are coming over and our own wonderfully dysfunctional royal family. So we have our own Prince Regent looking um, well fed, um, and his wife, who is going to later on, of course, be involved in the 
trial of Queen Caroline, who herself is no, no, um, no beauty, but also perhaps no, no card of respectability herself. And their daughter, Princess Charlotte, who is at this point in time by some seen as the shining light and the hope of all England, and by others seen as an impertinent hoyden. Um, it's not the greatest model of family unity. It's a dysfunctional family. Um, it's uh, um, headed by the Prince Regent, who is unpopular right now at all levels of society, and is certainly um, not the kind of contrast for the, the kind of fit military martial men who are the heroes of the day. The Prince Regent designs uniforms. He makes himself a field marshal. He never fights. Now, for whatever, you know, there's a whole story behind that. But by this point in time in his life, he's anything but an inspiring physical sight as well. John Cam Hobhouse, who's no fan of, no, no, no fan of the Prince Regent at the best of times, but when he goes to the opera during the middle of this visit, and he sees the Prince Regent in the midst of the Allied sovereigns and the generals and the various diplomats, you know, writes down in his diary that evening, and he says, um, and he says, when you see them, you, the, the prince looked large and white and wallowing, <laughs> and a sad contrast to the healthy monarchs between whom he sat. And I think that's, that's worth noting because of the fact that he is a physical contrast to them. He is also more than that. He's a moral contrast to them, um, at least as they appear to be at this point in time to the public. Uh, they're at a time when respectability is becoming more important, when moderation is becoming more important, when moral domesticity is becoming a model of, of virtuous masculinity, the Prince Regent is known for marital infidelity, petty jealousies, vindictiveness, gambling, and a variety of immoderate appetites. He's not absolutely the most inspiring individual we've got. And of course, his relationship with his wife is disastrous, and, and we know a lot about that. He's also, of course, a, a classic case for the satirists of the day. And this is the height of political satire. You know, this is the world of Gilray and Crookshanks and a whole host of other satirists. And there is a wonderful piece that's called the, the, the Two Journals. It's basically a day in the life. And you have the day in the life of the Prince Regent. And then I'll show you a little later on, a day in the life of Alexander, Emperor of Europe. And the two are extremely different. So let's just take a quick look at a day in the life of the Prince Regent. It starts out with him with a hangover, <laughs> gets up, but even before he gets up, he has visions of his wife, um, who of course isn't there because they don't live together, but the, 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 the nightmare is of her appearance, and there seem to be sort of serpents and demons in the corner. Um, he then spends hours with four valets getting his hair and his body done. Once he's finally dressed, he goes to meet with his, his chums to go over um, patterns for new, new uniforms. This is his work, supposedly. Um, when he needs to go out in the, in the evening, instead of being open and accessible and, and available to his public, he snuck out the back door by McMahon, one of his, 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 his rather rakish friends, to get into a carriage and fly down the road, with all the, the windows up, of course, while he's being booed and hissed by the public to go to the drawing room. He then finally gets home, again to consider things about just dressing and redressing, and he ends the evening tipsy and drunk and being carried to bed by his, by his um, uh, valets and his, his gentlemen in waiting. This is the image that is being perpetuated about the Prince Regent at the time. So a day in the life of the Prince Regent. Of course, the problem too is that he's not very good and rather like Donald Trump, he says the wrong things at the wrong time. <laughs> And where if he would have kept his mouth shut, he probably would have been better off. Um, luckily, tweeting was, didn't exist in 1814. But he goes and he, his, he sends his, he gets his, his mother, the queen, Queen Charlotte, to host some drawing rooms. Of course, you want to be able to welcome these allied sovereigns properly in a court situation to, to London while they're, they're here. 
and also uh, Princess Charlotte is, is, is appearing on publicly for one of the first times, all of this. But he then goes on and specifically informs his mother that she is not, and she's to make it clear that she is not going to be allowed to accept the Princess of Wales attendance at any of these events. So the Princess of Wales, who has been living in relative seclusion, relatively quiet seclusion, um, is uh, understandably incensed, but also is incensed because of the fact that her political advisors tell her to be incensed. So there's two things going on here. And in classic Prince of Wales and, and Princess of Wales fashion, they go straight to the newspapers. So the, the letter from the Queen to the Princess of Wales is here, and then we have as well um, a whole series. Basically, there are three letters. So you get the letter from the Queen to the Princess of Wales, the letter from the Princess of Wales back to the Queen saying, basically, this isn't nice. You, you, you know injured pride and all of that. And then there's a, next to that, there's a letter from the Princess of Wales to the Prince Regent, all of which get you know, placed, uh, um, placed it into the middle of the newspapers of the day so everyone can read them. And of course, the people who are in the know are standing there with their heads in their hands again. And as you can see by someone like um, the Dowager Lady Vernon, you know, they're not in the slightest bit happy. Um, and, you know, she, you know, they're, they're working on the idea that you know, this could have all been kept quiet, we could have looked respectable, and there he went, he blew it again. And so the manner in which he is talked of by all ranks of people is frightful. And should our excellent king be taken off shortly, the consequences are greatly to be dreaded. And uh, the point is that she's used that to her advantage, the, queen, or the, the uh, Princess of Wales, and no one can actually say that he isn't to blame. And so this is a situation that we're seeing just before the Allied sovereigns appear. And of course, this is all happening right in the middle of the London season. When are you going to invite the, the, the sovereigns to London? Well, the best time to do it is in the middle of the season. And this is, if we're talking um, you know, historical romance, this is the Georgette Hayer world. If you're talking about the point where the London season is being codified, and is at it, the height of its, of its glory, perhaps, for this entire period. This is it. So they're coming into London, looking its best, with the parks in glory, um, with the houses, the great houses open, with the ladies who, who run the events of the great houses, and the dining and the assemblies and the balls. Everything is there, ready and waiting for the, for the Allied sovereigns to appear. And so, We've got a sense of, of London like this, but we've also got a teeming city. This is the biggest city in Europe at the time. And it's a city that is increasingly literate, it's increasingly urban, it's highly commercial. This is the key commercial city of, of, of a growing empire. And it's a, a city that is entrepreneurial and extremely active. The Londoners of the 18th century and into the early 19th century did not sit on their hands and they were not overly deferential. And so this is a teeming world where what's going on at the elite end in terms of the celebrations that we're going to be talking about is going to be matched by a, a massive popular upswell that's going to see everything from the street urchin through the apprentice through the uh, shopkeeper and the artisan on the streets, wanting their own piece of the action, and often wanting a piece of, of uh, one of the, uh, the visitor's hair, or at least a piece of their shirt, or um, at least to touch them. So there's this kind of sort of culture of fandom that's being generated at the time. It's quite interesting. So how do we know about these people? Well, one of the things that they, we know about these people and the Londoners know about these people is they know about them because there have been prints and prints and prints as well as continuous newspaper reports throughout the war, but increasingly, of course, towards these last years of the war. And so you've got, and uh, you could have seen in your print shop as you were walking down the street, Cossack sports or Platoff in full cry after, the, after French game. And here you've got 
good old Cossacks. Again, these are the exotic people of the war. You know, they're seen as being just slightly almost above, above the animal, not quite civilized. They're sort of like you know, being seen almost in the same way as, as um, uh, indigenous people in some of the colonial countries. They're not quite sure about them, but they're, they're incredibly good fighters. You know, they may be a bit wild, but they're incredibly good fighters, and Platoff leads them. So the idea is that he's powerful, but also you've got the, uh, the wonderful story that came with this, is that he had offered um, to marry his daughter to anyone who, and, and I think also there was a huge amount of money in, involved in this as well, to anyone who could actually defeat Napoleon. Um, so this is why, if you see in the background, there's a woman riding a horse as well in the hunting scene. So Platoff and his daughter on the pursuit of French game. And on the other side, of course, we've got the wonderfully mustachioed um, General von, uh, von Blücher. And Blücher, here again, in activity, and he's, he's known as Forwards, General Forwards, because his, his approach to, to battle was forward. And incredible, inexhaustible, positive, he seems to have been, of all of the people who come to London in this period, people fall in love with Blücher. They, they, they like him. He's an, he's an old man by this point in time. He's in his 70s. He's 71. And so for this time period, he's an old man. He's going to die at 77. Um, uh, Platov is, is slightly younger. He's in his 60s somewhere. But he, what he doesn't have, Platov doesn't have any other language besides Russian. When, um, they say Rus. It may be that he was only speaking Ukrainian, actually. I'm not quite sure. But um, Blucher, of course, is, is, is multilingual and has French, and so that's not an issue in the slightest. So he can communicate. Um, but in terms of personality, he's got the appeal. Now, we've got these kinds of prints. We've also got all kinds of portraits of these men that are available as prints. During the time that they are here in London, the Prince, of, uh, uh, Prince Regent will, will have them painted. And if you didn't happen to miss the visit of the Allied sovereigns and wanted to get a memento or you wanted to take one home, the classic British entrepreneurialism, you could buy a series of portraits of illustrious persons um, with all of them so you could identify them and take it home with you. So this is classic, classic British entrepreneurialism, commercialism um, uh, rampant. So we've got this kind of a group of people, and as I said, the Cossacks themselves are one of the people that, one of the groups of people that particularly captured the attention of the newspaper man. And so, for instance, in advance of the actual arrival of the Allied sovereigns, you have a group of the, um, the Cossacks coming early. They're going to be one of the groups that's going to form the bodyguard for Platov. And the Kentish Gazette promptly describes them here and, and talks about them. And that description will then get transferred in the way that, that um, news in, in uh, the end of the 18th century, early 19th century did. It would get republished by the London papers who would then republish it. It would then get republished in the other uh, newspapers across the country. And news traveled quickly. This is one of the benefits of this time period already. Not only do we have more literate people who are reading, but we also have a much improved system of communication. The turnpike roads are extremely efficient. And so you can get news back and forth quite quickly. So here we are with a party of Cossacks landing. They go as far as, as the bridge. And then they rest. And this is the, the, one of the stories about the Cossacks that gets repeated again and again. The Russians live a simple life. You know, they're good, hardy men. And these Cossacks are really the most hardy of all of them. And so they don't, they, they don't, they don't sleep in beds. OK? So they don't sleep in beds. And so, and, but, they, but they capture people's attention. And part of the reason they captured people's attention is because they had an elaborate look. Now, the picture I've got is Cossacks in Paris. I wasn't able to find one of them in England. But they're, they're, they're elaborate, and they look exotic to people of the time. I think for all of us, looking at some of the uniforms of this time period, we think they all look exotic. But to the contemporaries, the Cossacks look particularly exotic. So. We've got people coming in to London. The newspapers have been speculating for days about when 
the Allied sovereigns are going to leave Paris. They're going to leave Paris today. No, they're going to leave Paris tomorrow. They're going to come to Boulogne. They're going to go this way. They're going to do that. So-and-so's left. Well, no, so-and-so hasn't left, and so on. And you get this, this building up of tension and anticipation through the, um, through the newspapers. And finally, the Allied sovereigns arrive. And that's immediately going to be put out in the papers. And the newspapers will, will all tell the various stories about the arrival of the sovereigns and who arrived and list all the names and everything like that. But we also have people who happen to be there. And we've got a lovely little letter from 17-year-old um, Maria, or Muzzy Capel, to her grandmother, the, uh, the Countess of Uxbridge. Now, the Capels were leaving England because of the fact that her father was a massive gambler and horribly in debt, and they were going to go and move to the continent to try and recoup the for family fortunes. But it just so happened, they thought they would miss all the sovereigns, and they timed themselves right, and they ended up being timed exactly at the wrong time. So they are in the inns at Dover waiting for the wind to turn, and so they can actually leave when everyone arrives. And I think it's well worth taking a look at what um, Muzzy Capel says in this, because it not only tells us a little bit about what she thinks the site is about and what she thinks her grandmother would want to know, but it also gives us a sense of you know, this importance of listing off the names. Who was it that she saw? Well, they came to my room with Sir Charles Stewart, okay, diplomat. You've got General Boucher, General Bulau, General Barclay de Tolly. Now, he's an interesting one because he's a Jacobite, um, he's a Jacobite family member, but based in Europe. So he's a European soldier, but with Jacobite heritage. General de York, and so on, and so on, and so on. So we've got all of these. And again, it's Blucher who catches her attention. Blucher almost shook our hands off and kissed us all in such a moving way. But this is the next thing, the moment the people, and of course the people or the mob, this is the language that's used repeatedly when we're talking about the crowd and crowd action of the time. The moment the people got wind of his being with us, they broke the windows to see him well. Now, 18th century crowds and early 19th century crowds had a thing about windows. And we, we know that, we know that we, you know, if you had anything going on that was crowd action, your windows were toast. Um, so that's not surprising. Uh, and hundreds of people of all sorts crowded into the room. And so, and we've got a little bit further on, she goes, the people took the horses off Blucher's carriage and drew it. Harriet and I, who were walking with Mr. DeRuz, were almost squeezed to death in such a crowd. And the re repetition about the crowd and the numbers of people, and that everybody who is anybody has, has come out at this point in time to see um, the, the, the crowds of people is, is repeated again and again and again. And there's arguments or, or comments about the road, the 72 miles between Dover and London being crowded three and four deep all the way to the point where the Allied sovereigns, instead of doing the trip all in public, actually end up going part way in incognito and basically turning out in London when they weren't quite expected. Um, so... So, got a, an idea of it here. So we've got the whole population of the neighboring, it's just in the middle of it, I'm not gonna read the whole thing. The neighboring district seems to have poured itself forth to hail the arrival of our allies, beneficent monarchs, patriotic princes, and generals distinguished for valor and success. But notice the seeds of British greatness and British myth-making. These are already here. Nothing could carry to the mind of a foreigner a finer idea of the comfort, opulence, and greatness of the British community than thus to see all at once on his first entry into this island the countless number of well-dressed people, the long lines of splendid vehicles. If you think about cars being a sta status symbol today, carriages at this point in time were the status symbols. And so if you've got a really good series of carriages, they're expensive, top flight, painted in the ultimate, you know, the color of the moment, trendy, that's what you want to see. So uh, splendid vehicles, and every sign of wealth and industry increasing more and more as he advanced through a beautiful country 
to the capital itself, the emporium of universal commerce. Now, maybe a little bit overegged, just a touch, but you can see already where the seeds are for the, the telling of this story of victory in Europe as being an, a British story, you know, superintended by British greatness instead of being a story of first among e amongst equals or as a, a group of equals, and that, that certainly wasn't there. So we've got, we've got this very distinct approach to telling the story. Now, it's at Emperor Alexander that we're, we're particularly focused on because of the fact that he was the one who was at the center of this visit. And he was also the one who was um, most interesting in some ways to many of the British. And we've got reports of his appearance in London because he finally gets there incognito. And what he's done, and this is already he puts the Prince Regent at odds and the government at odds because the Prince Regent has basically tossed his brother, the Duke of Cumberland, out of his lodgings and done them up specially for Emperor Alexander. Um, and Alexander instead goes straight over to where his sister's staying at Pulteney Hotel and stays there. Um, which puts the Prince Regent's nose out a tiny bit, and it, things only get worse from there. However, what he, what he also does is the news gets around, and this is one of the, ex the kinds of things that we see in, in this period, is how, how vital the, the news networks are. So here we have John Cam House again being grumpy, as usual, having got stuck in the traffic, effectively, um, around Pulteney Hotel, as um, Alexander is there. But what's interesting again here is the mob, the people on the street, everybody's there, hurrahing every carriage, especially if it had a Cossack or a dragoon behind it. And he goes on from there. I was unable to pass Pulteney um, Hotel. Betsy Fremantle, who's the wife of uh, Vice Admiral Thomas Francis Fremantle, happens to be in London for the season as well at that point in time. And she's on the other side of this. She wants to see um, the Emperor Alexander. So she goes with, wants to see everybody and the great people arrive, but she misses them. So she makes a real point of driving by Pulteney Hotel on her way back home. Um, she's held up for a little while, but unfortunately doesn't get a chance to see him. Not that day at any rate. However, the next day, she's out on the streets again. And as she says there, she said, drove about the town in hopes to meet these sovereigns, the streets crowded with carriages. And you get this kind of feeling that everybody's out there looking. Can we find them? Can we see them? Can we, can we get in touch with them? I want to see the emperor. I want to see the king of Prussia. Um, here's James Frampton, to further down the social scale, but you know, solid gentry type. And he's in town staying with his grandmother so that he can see this. And he's been sending letters back and forth to his mother, sort of updates. They're almost like emails. You know, I did this, and then you know, a few hours later, I did this, and at 4 o'clock, I'm writing this, and here's what's going on. So here, an hour after I sent you my last one, I caught a perfect sight of the emperor who came out on the balcony of the Pulteney Hotel and bowed several times to the people. So this idea of coming out and bowing, of the crowd calling and huzzahing and cheering, repeated again and again and again, all the way through this period. So people on foot, innumerable. And to, so masses of people out there. Um, another uh, gentry woman in this case, upper gentry, uh, looking here at what she wants to do and what I think is interesting about this one is that she's bound and determined she's going to see that emperor. And I've not yet seen the emperor, but mean to sit in my carriage opposite ha his house. And so this notion of, you know, if there were para a paparazzi, she would have been out there with, with the camera. You know, she's there definitely going to be able to, to catch him, catch view of him. Um, they go all over the place. So we've got, den uh, we've got newspapers that are reporting their every movement. At 8 o'clock in the morning, they do this. At 10 o'clock in the day, we do that. So on and so on and so on. And the details of their activities are known. And so you can go and look out for them at one place or another. They go off to Woolwich to um, 
uh, review the ordinance, and they're accompanied by masses of livery boats and corporation boats and music on the river, and people like Betsy Fremantle, who takes her two young daughters out. They go in a wherry, and they just happen. We arrived just in time, followed in a wherry to London Bridge, where we were close to the Middle Arch, when all the royal barges shot through and had a very good view of them. So it's this business of you know, following them around London, trying to catch, catch glimpses of them. Now, uh, C.B. Wollaston, uh, another gentry chap, is again writing to his sister, and he's saying, I have been emperor hunting two mornings. And this is exactly what they're doing. You know, he's, he's, he's looking at the paper. They're going to be here. I know they're going to be there. So off I go. And so he's off emperor hunting. And he's, he's, he's done it. And notice what he says. You could actually, I had no doubt of his person from the likeness of the prince. So he's actually been looking at the prince, knows who he's looking for, and that's fine. No problem at all. However, Mrs. Fisher, who, see, who sees the emperor and crowd at Ascot, because they go to the races, comes up with something else, and she's going, well, I'm, really, I wish they would have sort of worn name tags. You know, I wish they would have worn some kind of mark to distinguish them for the sake of the common people, because they won't necessarily know who they are. So the idea there that perhaps the common people aren't as, as well informed, they aren't as visually um, literate about who these people are, but they know that they want to see them. So maybe we should do that. And of course, what you get as well, though, is you get the lack of deference of the Londoners. And this is perfectly captured here in a, um, a, a print called Russian Condescension, or the Blessings of Universal Peace. As poor Platoff is walking down the street, he's accosted. Actually, no, sorry, this one isn't Platoff. This is Alexander. Um, and we can tell it's Alexander because the woman he's with is his, his wife, uh, his, sorry, his sister, the Grand Duchess, and she is always depicted as wearing what becomes known as an Oldenburg poke bonnet. And it's a fashion that she brings with her, and it becomes the trend of the day. And the, the idea that these people are going to just break through and touch, hold, grab, kiss, okay, um, whoever it happens to be. And so this is, there's all kinds of references to exactly this kind of thing happening, of the dragoons reaching down from the carriages to shake innumerable hands, of Blucher being kissed, of Platov being kissed, and so on and so forth. So lots and lots of touchy-feely stuff. Again, the kind of thing that you would see of, of, with a movie star, perhaps, of the day. Now, the emperor is, it gets to the point where he's a bit fed up, understandably. And he says that um, he's also a bit surprised because he'd expected there to be more division amongst the people, more obvious physical, visual differences in class. And of course, the Londoners are very proud of this, you know, that, that in a sense, the people are so well dressed that he could not suppose there was any distress. And of course, this is a time period when there is rising poverty in the country. Um, and things aren't necessarily easy. And you have all kinds of stratagems being used to try and get to see the emperor. Now, there's these people on the streets and whatnot, but I think Harriet Frampton's got the best one. You know, not only did she want to see the emperor, but she actually arranged with Lady Strafford so that she could sit on her stairs while they were going to dinner, so she could actually see them as they walked past her. So, you, you, you know, the, it, it takes a bit of a, a, a connection for us to try and get ourselves into that mindset. And I, also, if you look in that top corner there, I've got an, a ticket to the great guild hall um, banquet that was, was put on by the Marin Corporation for um, the Allied Sovereigns, enormous uh, dinner. And have about seating about 470, I think, if my memory's right. However, that ticket isn't for people who want to go to the dinner. That ticket is for the ladies. It's to admit one lady, because they put up a gallery for 600 ladies so that they could go and watch the Allied sovereigns and the various gathered elite to have their dinner. And, and they were fought for. These were important. 
Now, I said that the contrast was between the Prince Regent and Alexander. And I showed you that first day in the life. Now, this is the second day in the life. And let's just take a quick look at Alexander's day in the life, because this is actually put out in the papers. And there are specific articles that say Prince Ale or Emperor Alexander and the English, spelling out for the readers just how different Alexander's way of life is from the Prince Regent's. So Alexander is up early. He's up by 7 o'clock in the morning, usually. And he's dressed simply, goes out walking. And he goes out walking with his sister and her widowed sister and her, her son. And they go out and walk the streets with almost no, um, no bodyguard, no servants. They're basically just out walking, not creating a fuss about anything. They meet people. They see things. They're interested in the commerce and the, and the city. Um, they live a quiet life. And I'm just going to skitter the way through that. By the time that he comes back from seeing things that are all dutiful and, and useful and commercial, um, he comes back to do business. And then he goes to bed very early, very sober, very, very um, proper. So this is, the, this is the image that's being created. There's a con this contrast between the Prince Regent and Alexander. Now, as I said before, Alexander gets up the Prince Regent's nose a bit. He also annoys the administration. And he annoys the administration specifically because of the fact that he tends towards the opposition. He's also seen quite at this time as quite a liberal monarch. He, he won't be liberal um, later on in his, in his later years. But at this time, he's seen as being a very liberal monarch and very forward thinking. And this concerns some people. So if you are a supporter of the administration, you're only too glad by the end of that, towards the end of that third week, that these guys are going to be going home. So Dowager Lady Vernon here again, she says, the emperor is to stay till Thursday, and then I hope take his final departure. And of course, what they're going to do is leave on the 21st and then make their way through Petworth down to Portsmouth and then go, go um, take ship from there. There has been quite enough of it. It makes all sorts of people so thoroughly idle from morning till night, and one cannot help feeling that afraid that something unpleasant might arise. And this is basically a, a reference to politics and to concerns about, um, again, the, the struggle between the Prince Regent and Caroline. The opposition are seemingly so much favored by the emperor. Okay, so it, it's, it's the uh, worry that he's going to inflame domestic politics if he stays any longer. So this is, this is the concern. By the time that we get to this point, pretty much everybody's exhausted. Blucher is to the point where he's, he, he's reputedly saying um, that Napoleon couldn't kill him, but he thinks the English might. Um, because he's just exhausted. It's, it's, it's a series. Any London season is a series of events, usually overlapping events. There's balls, assemblies, theater, opera, dinners, you name it. And they, they tend to be overlapping, and people from the fashionable set will go to a one and then another and then another. They'll flip between them. But what's going on at this year and these three weeks is, is phenomenal because there's so much going on, and there's so many people vying for these people's attention and for their presence at their parties. And so there's an excess for what is already an excessive and very hard partying um, period of, of, of the year. Everything ends on the 20th of June in London. And it ends with White's Ball. And White's Ball is spectacular. And it had actually been sort of in question whether it was going to take place. And it happens at Burlington House. But it was in question earlier whether it was going to take place because there was a concern that the Prince Regent would lay down stringent uh, rules again as to whether or not anybody who was a member would be able to give their tickets as they wished. In other words, what he didn't want, of course, was to have Caroline appear at the ball. Um, and in, in the end, there's no, no chance of that happening. And, and, they, and the members of White's Club come to a, a, an agreement. And this is a subscription ball. 
Unlike many subscription balls of the period, it comes with stri uh, strictures as to what people are going to wear, and women are instructed to appear in white and silver, and what I've read is the minimum cost of one of the dresses for this ball, even quite a simple one, was about 20 pounds. That's a lot of money at this point in time. And men, of course, were to come in, in, in full kit or preferably, if they could, of course, in uniform. And so you've got this glorious array. You can, you can image, imagine it in your mind of the women in the white and silver sparkling under the lights, um, the men in glowing uniforms from various countries, a babel of languages, English and French predominantly, but certainly some German, maybe a bit of Italian, and, and maybe a bit of Spanish. And you've got the ball taking place. And again, Betsy Fremantle, who is in her 30s at this point in time, so she's, she's not going really for herself, or so she says. She's going to chaperone one of her nieces. But if you read what she says, it sounds like she had a pretty good time herself. And what's interesting here is it becomes both a classic kind of British London season ball, where she goes and she meets everybody who sees all her friends and has a really good gossip. But it's also, it is the place where you really see for the last time these great and good, the illustrious heroes. So you, she's noting, you know, she saw the Empress, Emperor of Russia, she saw the Duchess of Oldenburg, his, his sister, the King of Prussia, and so on. They all arrived at 10 o'clock. I was close to them when they first walked through the ballroom and saw, so that's two saws, apologies for that, saw them very plain. They afterwards mixed in the crowd. Again, they're open to the public. Is the regent open to the public? No, but they're mixing with the people. And Alexander danced the whole evening and flirted with his partners. And of course, that's the kind of gossip that any good 18th century London woman from the elite is going to really have paid attention. Who's he flirting with? When the supper rooms were open, the effect was quite beautiful. 2,400 people sat down without any inconvenience or confusion. I stayed until 7, 7 o'clock in the morning, met almost everybody I know in London. Fremantle got tired, this is her husband, and went home an hour before us. So, so did she enjoy herself? Absolutely. Um, and look at the end of this. The end bit on this entire evening is, Old Blucher is a delight with her own exclamations. And again, it's this business of Blucher really catching people's attention. Now, the next day, the Allied sovereigns and their entourages pack up and leave. You can't get a horse for love or money in London as they're heading out. But so too are a lot of the people who have been in London for the period. And I think it's really telling that after all of this press, publicity, print culture, activity, street action, and everything that's gone on, all of this, this furore, all of this very open, um, welcoming Europeanness, which they were, they were doing, this is all going to vanish. And it's all going to vanish because of the fact that in a few months, We'll have Waterloo. And this will be a social occasion. It won't be a political occasion. It won't be remembered in that way. The story and the myth-making is going to be around Wellington. It's going to be around English glory, English valor, English soldiers. The battlefield is not going to be Leipzig. It's going to be Waterloo. But for the people who were in London for that season, it may stay really important. And I think I'll end with Mary Heber's letter to her brother, and she comes home the day after White's Ball. I cannot let a day pass at home without thanking you for all your kindness, oops, sorry, that should be to me, in town, to which I am indebted for the most interesting part of my excursion, and without which I must have lived and died without seeing the Emperor of Russia. Thank you. One last addendum as well. 
In England, as always, there was a commercial imperative. And the allied sovereigns may have gone, but the fashion designers did a Blucher bonnet and Spencer, that was the fashion of the day, and an Oldenburg poke hat. 